Hello, this is Julia Whitup with Talk Story TV, and I have with me this morning Norman Wilson, the author of Shamanism, What's It All About? And I'm sure a lot of people are anxious to hear what that's all about. Go ahead, Norm. Hello, and thank you for inviting me. Shamanism is an interesting topic and it has been something that I've been interested in for many years. I'd like to clarify a couple of misinformation things about shamanism. Uh, first of all, it's not a religion. It never has been a religion. It has no dogma. It has no priesthood. Uh, it has no uh, deity that it worships uh, like organized religions do. And I also am aware that some of the Native Americans are not happy with the word shamanism or shaman uh, because they refer to their healers as med medicine people sometimes. The word came into popular use back in the 1600s. And my attitude is, get over it. You can't ride a painted pony anymore either. So shamanism and shaman are what is in the popular language, and that's what people know. And that's not a derogatory comment either. A shaman is a healer, and uh, was what you might call the early form of doctors, and that's what we had. Unlike modern doctors, the shaman used not only the medicines of his day, which was primarily herbs and herbals, but he also called upon the spirit world to help him heal. And if we stop and think a moment, in most modern religions, people pray to their divinity to heal a sick person. So what is the difference? Here is the difference. The shaman travels to the spirit world to get help for his patient. And that's significant. And we want to keep that in mind, please. Once the shaman has determined the nature of his patient's illness, he then will go ahead and either prescribe a series of herbs for healing. Uh, he may uh, use sound to change the vibration patterns of the person's body. Uh, he may then uh, use crystals and place those crystals on the person or around the person to bring healing energy. All of this is earth-based, and that I think is significant. We are of the earth, and we need to remember that. Then, if those things don't seem to be really clicking the way the shaman wants it to, he will then go into a deep trance and ask the spirit world for help. He doesn't go with a great big long litany of things that he wants done. He goes with one fundamental question. And he's always respectful when he goes to the spirit world. And he asks for their wisdom and bring healing energy to his patient. Sometimes, Julia, he will have with him a helper. This may be an animal spirit or it may be the soul of a human being that is no longer on earth asking for their help. Always the key thing here, as far as, as far as I am concerned, is to be respectful. If we are not that way, we will not receive the answer to our question. Uh, the thing that people are doing today that bothers me is they're pushing the use of hallucinogenic drugs for a trance. I do not approve of that. I believe if you are hallucinating, you are not aware of what you're doing or what you're hearing. And if you're asking help, you have to know what the answer is from the spirit world, or you're going to lose it. A lot of people are hunting down shaman to experience the trips that they get that's replacing LSD from the old days. That's bad. We have a lot of people who are claiming to be shaman when they're not. They're just taking people's money and maybe, in many instances, doing people harm. I also want to point out that there are various types of shaman. 
among my shaman friends that I have, and there are several, uh, some trained in Tibet. Others lived in the Amazon jungle with shaman who was trained there for over 11 years, 12 years. So they're very authentic. Uh, some of them do not use herbs in their treatment. Some do not treat people at all, but they are bringers of messages from the spirit world. And so we have to look at what kind of shaman we're dealing with in the shamanic realm. Uh, and they're not taking away anything from those. I have a friend who uh, trained uh, with three Tibetan shaman uh, for a long period of time, and her thing is colors. She looks at people's colors and looks at the colors in the world and translates that into meaningful experience. Uh, another one of my friends who is a shaman just returned from Tibet recently, uh, deals on a highly psychic level in healing her patients. And then my friend who is a shaman who lives in the Canary Islands uh, is a message bringer from the spirit world. And I think we, we need to tune into those. I think that if we look at it just in a very broad perspective, we're trying to find alternative ways to heal ourselves rather than the very expensive drugs that are prescribed today. Many of them very dangerous. You can't help but listen to a TV ad for a new drug and they list, well, it could do this, 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 and this to you. And, well, it could kill you. And who needs to put all of that poison in your body? So the shaman's a naturalist. He loses things from Mother Earth. Uh, lots of the herbs. Tree bark, uh, for example. Uh, some things are used for kidney issues. Others for high blood pressure. Uh, some to help ladies who are experiencing morning sickness. Uh, sore muscles, lack of energy, you got it, it's there. Uh, one of the things involving with the return to natural elements, of course, is what I fear is happening as the decimation of the natural forests and hunt for the medicinal drugs that we use uh, based on natural products. We have to be careful with that because some of them cannot be easily replaced once we destroy their environment. And that's a whole other topic right there, if you don't mind. Yeah. How does one become a shaman? My attitude is you don't go to school to become a shaman. Uh, there are courses offered in shamanism at many of our major universities. Uh, we have the foundation for the study of shamanic, for the study of shamanism. And you can uh, take classes and be trained to be a shamanic practitioner, and that's different than being a shaman. And that's not being uh, picky. That's what they advocate. And uh, Michael Harner, who is really the grandfather of reintroducing shamanism to the Western world once again, uh, insist on that. You're not really being a shaman, you're being a shaman practitioner. And he is trying to reintroduce the old ways of healing, and he's done a marvelous job with this, and his books are excellent. Uh, if anybody wants to ever read them, uh, they're available uh, at Amazon or wherever, in bookstores. I think also that once the shaman has uh, determined the need, how does he go into a trance when I've said I do not approve of hallucinogenic drugs? He uses the drum. Mm. The drum is the oldest form of uh, creating a trance. It's been around for years, uh, centuries, if you will. Um, 
I think it is very powerful. Uh, I use the drum. I recently did a lecture on uh, the use of herbs by shaman, and I took the, the audience on a shamanic journey by the use of drum. Very short one, and some experienced some interesting things, which is not the point here today. I think we need to be aware of that, and if you're going to look for a shamanic healer, check their background, ask the right questions. How did you become a shamanic healer? Were you trained in a specific institution? Have you had training in the use of herbs and herbals? Or is this just something you've made up? Uh, you get the wrong combination of herbs or herbals, and you can die. Not all blueberries are edible, Julia, and we forget that. that. Not Everybody? all blueberries are edible? No, not all blueberries are edible. Wow. Uh, people go out and begin picking things. <laughs> like those who go and seek mushrooms, they sometimes get poisonous ones. And so we have to be careful if we decide we're going to go on hunting for these things. There are herbal pharmacies, by the way, and uh, herbal stores, and I'm not talking about pot. Um, we have one in the Seattle area where I live. Uh, it's been there since uh, the early 1900s, and it's very old. Uh, we do have a farm that raises herbals, and you can go and be trained in what herbals are and what they're used for. So there are ways to find out which, which ones you can be used. The uh, doctors have a book called the Practitioner's Direct Reference Book, and there is one now on herbal medicine. And then years ago, uh, that was not accepted to have such a book. So doctors are beginning to get involved now that there are natural ways of treating their patients. I think that's good. Um, we have aromatherapists uh, who are using uh, various kinds of herbs to create their therapies. Um, we have, uh, I mentioned um, a herbal pharmacist. We have herbal healers, we sometimes call them naturopaths. And that's a very, and we have a university that trains that very much into natural um, living. So perhaps you have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah. Um, what, what's the difference between a shaman and a shamanistic practitioner? Okay, a shaman. That's a good question. And a shaman practitioner. Traditionally, shamans are passed on. They're inherited from one generation to the next. Or a shaman may be called through uh, the spirit world to be a shaman and they go on a vision quest. Uh, that's a rather a long uh, thing, sometimes several days without food or water. Um, sometimes they're in a dark cave, sometimes a hole in the ground where they are communicated with from the spirit world. Uh, sometimes the shaman uh, has a near-death experience and comes out of that and has learned how to heal someone. Uh, a practitioner is one who has been trained which herbs are usable, uh, what crystals are usable, um, as opposed to that which has been passed down or inherited. Uh, years ago, when I was back in the college classroom, one of my students uh, was a shaman in training, and he was having his skills transferred to him by his grandmother, who had been a shaman. And women can be shaman as well as men uh, in the Native American. Uh, and he had been started when he was five years old, uh, I believe, and he hoped maybe by the time he was 25 he would be willing, the tribe would be willing to accept him as one of their healers. So it's a long process. Mm -hmm. uh, 
The Foundation by Michael Harner offers multiple courses in training how to be a pract practitioner. And I think that's fine, it's wonderful. And they're very well certified. So if you get to a, a, a practitioner who's been trained with the Michael Harner people, you know you're safe. Great. Okay. And, um, yeah, this is a very interesting book, by the way. Thanks for sending me a review copy. <laughs> It's a little book, and I made it little deliberately. It does not advocate, it explains. And if people in our busy world today want to know what a shaman is or shamanism is, they can read a page, a chapter that is a page and a half, maybe long. Uh, so it's a quick read. Mm -hmm. And it's done that way deliberately, uh, rather than spending volumes and volumes, and there have been volumes written. So it's an, an information thing. And uh, I think that's where, good. Where, where can mm -hmm. people get your book? Uh, it's available at Amazon. Uh, of course, everything is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and I think um, I think I also put it up now as an ebook. And I can't remember whether it went up or not. And it's very expensive as an ebook. As it's either ninety nine cents or a dollar ninety nine. I don't remember which. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, I think that uh, the book is, is, is a good beginning for people who want to investigate. And there are many books. And I give a pretty good bibliography okay. in there. And uh, so I think that should be helpful to anyone who would be interested in reading it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for being with us today and talking to us about shamanism. I really appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. It's, it's an honor. Uh, I've admired the way you present. You're a marvelous host. Thank and you. And I appreciate that. Thank you, and you have a great day. You too.